Paw Bay, a town in the heart of England, in Northamptonshire, is one of the most Scottish places outside of Scotland, which is over 300 miles away. It has been nicknamed Little Scotland since a large number of Scottish migrated in the 1930s. This unusual association is what makes the town so unique. Even now, around two-thirds of the population is said to be Scottish or have Scottish roots. There are signs of Scottishness everywhere you look. Colby is one of the few places in England where you walk around the town centre and hear Scottish accents, especially Glaswegian, where people walk around wearing Celtic and Rangers tops, where most calves serve Scottish breakfast, where supermarkets and butchers sell Scotch pies, square sausages, black pudding, haggis, where iron brew is the local favourite fizzy drink, and where a Highland gathering is held every year. The town has its own pipe band, many residents celebrate Burns Night and Hogmanay at their local social club, and even send their children to Highland dancing classes. Billy DL from the Colby Heritage Centre has agreed to give us an insight into the town's Scottish community. We also have Betty, Jacqueline and Gary sharing their story of living in Colby as Scottish individuals. Let's hear what they have to say. Where did they all begin? Well, steelmaking in Colby uh, goes back um, to about the 1880s, but it was predominantly British or English uh, people that would have worked in the steelworks then. So the Scottish contingency that lives in the town uh, came here in the late 20s and early 30s, but predominantly the early 30s. Um, so for instance, my grandfather and my grandmother, they came to Corby uh, in the 1930s um, and they came from Glasgow. So the Scottish, most of the Scottish people in the town came from the Glasgow region. So places like Motherwell, Lanarkshire, um, and the industrial towns, Greenock is another famous one. Lots of people came from Greenock. Um, so they would have come down uh, when Stuarts and Lloyds formed in the 1930s because they were two separate companies. Before that, they were Lloyds and they were Stuarts and Menzies. They all got jobs because most of them worked in either the steelworks or the mines up in Scotland and they all came from the same area. And um, so they got, got jobs and then my mother came down here um, to Corby and my father got a house then in Corby. He had digs before that with people that he knew that had got a house because they were married. Um, but um, my father then got the house and um, we were all born in Corby, my, three, my two sisters and I, and um, that. And uh, most, most of the people in our street were Scottish and the people that were English from the old village couldn't understand a word we said. My mother said, you know. I was 18. Uh, I was working in Glasgow at the time and I had an aunt, an uncle and cousins who lived in Corby and we moved, well no, I moved here when I was 18, but 1986-87, uh, looking for work and I started working when ASDA was just built. How many Scottish came to Corby in the 1930s? If you look at censuses back then, uh, it was something like 50% were Scottish, um, 20 to 25% were Irish, and then the rest of the percentage was Welsh and English. So the English were actually a minority in the town by the time Stuart Moyes was up fully running. Um, so if we say 15,000 was the estimate then, you're looking at somewhere around 8 to 10,000, 8, 9,000 were Scottish, so the majority, the vast majority, uh, were, were Scottish, yeah. Did they get enough support from the local council? Yeah, if you, well, if you were Scottish, um, you kind of had a little bit of an advantage because um, quite a lot of the councillors uh, were Scottish because obviously in a democracy, uh, the thing about a democracy, I suppose, is that um, generally the, the, the largest party or largest amount of people probably get slightly better represented than everybody else. Was there ever a divide between the Scottish and the English? Um, the diplomatic thing would be to say no, um, but the truth of the matter is yeah, uh, yes, but in uh, more of a, uh, a sort of like friendly way. So it was generally noticed when you had things like the World Cup. So if you had the World Cup on, or even a, a big football match that was between England and Scotland, 
So if it was World Cup, the Scottish contingents would want the Scottish uh, teams to do really well. And obviously English would want the English to do really well. So that's the time when you noticed it. That's when it was really noticeable. Because when I, when I was at school, um, Scotland did actually start, it was in the late 70s, they, they actually did quite well in the World Cup. I think it was the last time they ever did. Um, so there was a lot of singing of um, Ali's Tartan Army and all this kind of thing. And, but it was, it was more a friendly thing. I don't remember, I, I mean, I lived here all my life, I don't remember really something being, I don't like you because you're English or I don't like you because you're Scottish. And if it was, it was generally uh, in a jokey kind of way or a friendly kind of joke. I don't remember there being antagonistic things. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you, you'd always get the ones that don't join in, you get that here now, but... Um, I, w I would say they found out the Scottish community would try things and try and do things together, get different ones pulled into it, and they would work together to, to put on. We had parties for the Queen's coronation in the streets and everything else. And, well, you know, anything that was going on, everybody mocked in and donated something towards it, you know what they could, and that was it. No, not really. You've got your international football, and that's where you've got your divide. But Corby's never been one for being bad with that. I mean, we used to have travel sections. You could go to maybe up to Hamden. You could go to Wembley. You could go on the same bus, which I'd done a couple of times, and there was no animosity or nothing because they all knew you were for Corby. And uh, you had pals that supported England where you worked. You get their banter, but there was no really badness. No one has seen it anyway. What difficulties did you face when you moved here? No, no, and anybody. I mean, I came, like, we came as individuals. We didn't come, like, a, we were not sent here. Um, Jimmy had just finished his national service. And I came to Corby and only knew that couple. We lodged mm. with them because I'd stayed in Grantham with some friends in Grantham until at that time you had to work for so long before you got your mm. before you got your allowance, you know, like your pregnancy money. Mm. And so Jim came here in the October, started work in October sixty three. 62, I beg your pardon, and uh, I came here, as I say, it was almost Easter when I came here, and I didn't know anybody, I was so lonely, you know, that was that was the only thing. My mother had insisted I keep my flat on in Glasgow, we had a wee flat in Glasgow, to see if I'd settle down, you know, and that year was the telling time. But I've never had any regrets about coming to Corby. I love Corby. I love the people. I love everything about it. Um, well, I never had a house. And there was a waiting list. And I think you had to be on the waiting list for something like three, four years. It was, it was quite long. Um, but when I got married and I had my son, um, I didn't wait very long after that, and I got a house, this house I'm in now, and I've never moved from there. Yeah. Do you feel involved in the Scottish community? Oh, very much so. I mean, mm. Scots run about you all the time. Mm -hmm. But in, in the 60s, particularly, on a Friday night, Batten's bus, well, Batten's buses, yeah. would be, there'd be about six buses, loaded up, going up to Scotland, mm -hmm. you know, and at the fair, you know, the Glasgow fair, which was a couple of weeks in the middle of August, people would all come down and they'd all come down in the Batons bus overnight That's right. and stop. And the mm -hmm. September weekend in Glasgow, there's a September mm -hmm. weekend, you know, it's the holiday weekend. People would come down for the weekend. I wouldn't say there is a big Scottish community. There is things like the Highland Gathering, uh, the Grampian Club, your Scottish International Football Clubs, 
but I'm not really involved with these sort of things. Just, uh, but they're there. I do, I do go to the Highland Gathering. Um, I sometimes go to the Grampian Club. I'm not, I'm not a drinker, so it's not really my scene. How has the Scottish community contributed to Corby's development? Um, I, th I suppose that comes back to kind of like a local authority sort of thing where you had uh, people that perhaps stood as councillors in Glasgow or Greenock or wherever they came from. Once they came here and worked, they then perhaps continued that um, uh, working as a councillor or uh, volunteering as a councillor. Um, so uh, governing, so if you look at when the steelworks started, Corby was actually run by Kettering Council. So Kettering's a town seven miles away. Um, Corby was such a small village, it didn't have its own council. It was actually run as a parish under Kettering Council. Um, so once Corby expanded and became too big to be run by Kettering, they formed a council, I think it was late 40s, officially by maybe the 1950s, and most of them were Scottish people. So they then made the decisions that we needed a, um, a local government offices. So they campaigned to have things like swimming pools, cinemas, um, local government offices, which we didn't have. They used to operate from the old village in small buildings. They then built a purpose-built council offices in the town centre in the mid-60s. That was all contributed, not entirely by Scottish, so I can't say it was just Scottish, but predominantly Scottish, because obviously they held, held the most seats. Um, in other ways, um, I think representation, so union-wise perhaps, for uh, workers' rights, that kind of thing, at the Steelworks, a lot of them would have uh, campaigned for union rights for better pay or uh, better pensions, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure in other ways, but main, yeah, they did contribute in that regard. And culturally as well, so if you think of the Highland Gathering, you think of the food that's been here, it, will, it has and will leave its mark on the town, so it'll always be remembered. I will say the Scottish community have put a lot into Corby mm -hmm. and so. they had a lot of good standards at that time in Corby and you had to abide by them. We used to get the Corby Leader which was a local paper mm. and every week there would be different societies you know like maybe a Keep Fit Society and they would do all sorts of things to raise money for the hospital. Mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, we raised no end of money in yeah. this town for the hospital, yeah. more than any other yeah. town yeah. in the area. Really, overall, when we look back, um, the Scottish community have created many, many things in Corby. They've got good Highland dancers here, good Scottish things. They've got a Grampian club of different things and They've worked hard to do it in all the, all the things they've done. And um, I think most of them have kept their principles. And I think that is most important. And I think I'd like to see a wee bit more of that in Corby now. So really, the Scottish built this town because they didn't know how to make steel. The Scottish came down and showed them how to make steel. The Irish came. Uh, some Welsh. So, in effect, we built this town. Built it up for nothing. What do you think the future is for the young Scottish generation in Corby? Hmm. Eh. I don't think the, the young generation bother much. We, um, I think they, do, they just learn it from their parents and just hand it down. Well, they, I don't think they bother as much as they used to. Second generation, it's, it's kind of fades away, doesn't it? But hopefully they keep it up. Um, I, suppose, I suppose there'll be um, several generations. So I was third generation when I was a kid. So I had my dad was born in England, but his parents were born in Glasgow. My, my mum's from Greenock. Um, and when I was at school, most of my friends were similar. So their grandparents were from Scotland. Parents might possibly be from Scotland, but probably England. My children now are fourth generation, so um, they don't think of any connection to Glasgow or Scotland really at all, other than they know we've got some relatives that live there. And obviously my surname, so in, in our surname it's preserved in that respect. Um, and I think the future for people that have got Scottish connections in Corby are going to be um, more of a historical side of it, 
not quite so much actively. For instance, when I was young, you had the Highland Gathering to go to, you had the, um, uh, there were Scotch dances, you could go to the Rangers Club. A lot of these things are starting to thin out now, they're becoming less prevalent, so uh, they're not quite as noticeable. But surnames, people's surnames, uh, they're still Scottish speaking, people with a Scottish accent in the town, they're still Scottish connections, it's, it's thinning out a bit now. Um, so I think it's probably like anywhere that um, has the same issue where you, you've got a culture that's becoming less prominent uh, and they're not as prominent anymore, that youngsters may not instantly look to that culture, but as they get older, so for instance, children that are 10, 20 years old now, perhaps when they're 40 or 50, will look back and think, where did our family originate from? Um, but that's a good question. I'm not sure what the future would be for them um, as an identity, so as an identity as them, for them being Scottish in that respect. Um, it's a difficult question. Yeah, I'm not sure how I'd answer that. But I think, I th I think it's just, um, for me, I actually lived in a town that felt Scottish. Every, Scottish accents everywhere, Scottish food, Scottish dancing, Scottish clubs to go to. There's, there's very little of that now for my children. And I think by the time their children are born, it will be an epilogue and a historical, in a library or the museum or the Harris Centre. Um, it won't necessarily be physical things. Yeah. Despite the fact that Corby still has a Scottish feeling, the attachment to Scotland, in general, has decreased throughout the years. There are two churches of Scotland in Corby, for whom the future does not look as bright. Janice can tell us more about it. She runs a weekly coffee morning at St Ninian's Church of Scotland, where the majority attending are Scottish. In Colby we have two Church of Scotland's. We have St Andrew's, which is the oldest one, which was opened in the 30s, late 30s. And then we have this one here, St Ninian's, which was opened in the 60s. Um, before, um, well, when the churches were opened, there was enough congregation to support two churches. Unfortunately, as the years have gone on and people have passed away, unless people go to church generally, as well as in the Church of Scotland, then the numbers have dwindled um, enormously. I think people see, when they see Church of Scotland, they think, I must be Scottish to go to that church. So if you're not Scottish, they don't tend to come. But we're basically a Presbyterian church here. So as the numbers have dwindled, um, it's fallen on the Church of Scotland to decide what to do with Corby. And the decision has been to, well, they amalgamate the two churches into one. So that means that one of the buildings will actually close. I do believe as well that they want to rename the church, the new church, with a different name. So it's neither St Andrew's nor St Ninian's. So we're waiting to find out which of the church buildings will actually be closing. And as at this moment in time, we don't know which one. Corby has now become very multicultural. The town is home to many nationalities, such as Polish, Lithuanians, Romanians. However, its little Scotland status and the impact that the Scottish community had and still has will always be remembered.